If you put a whole load of money in, say, consumers' pockets, then consumers are going to go out and buy stuff from business and business are going to invest and employ more. So, I mean, the best thing you can do for business during a recession is put money in the pockets of their customers. Uh, Just giving businesses money isn't going to lead us to a recovery. G'day and welcome to Follow the Money, the Australia Institute's podcast demystifying the big economic issues in Australia and putting them in plain English. I'm Ebony Bennett, Deputy Director at the Institute, and at the time of recording this on Tuesday the 12th of May 2020, The Guardian Australia reports that we have 766 active cases of COVID-19, 6,084 recovered cases and a tragic 97 deaths. And Australia has, with few exceptions, pretty much excelled in its public health response. And now attention is turning to the economy. And you might remember that just a few months ago, before Australia came into this recession, our economy was already in a weak position with the slowest wages growth since World War II. uh, Even the IMF had already warned the government to abandon its surplus objective and that Australia had relatively high levels of unemployment and underemployment. Then came the bushfires and the pandemic, which almost overnight shut down whole sections of the economy in order to fight a public health crisis. And that was absolutely the right call. We can see that no lockdown has had disastrous consequences for the United Kingdom and the United States. But it's also had enormous economic consequences for Australia, leading many people to call for restrictions to be lifted immediately in order for the economy to snap back. Today on the program, the path to economic recovery. There is a snap back. There is a snap back to the previous existing arrangements on the other side of this. It's a snap back, but to bring forward a snap back is potentially what they're talking about. And the idea that you can just have uh, support one day, no support the next, is quite frankly absurd. So there may be things that governments can do to transition off the payment. You clearly will need a transition of uh, the support mechanisms which are there. And allowing those that are still struggling because of the restrictions to stay on for a longer period. To achieve that COVID safe economy in July of this year. Just because we're easing restrictions doesn't mean the virus is less deadly. Treasury is forecasting GDP to fall by over 10% in the June quarter, which would represent our biggest fall on record. A very, very large uh, deficits in the near term, but that's a good thing. I mean, the other way to think of it uh, is uh, this is money left in the pockets of families, uh, in the pockets of business at a time when they need it most. Go hard, go smart uh, to drive the unemployment rate back down again. So this week I wanted to talk to Matt Grudnoff, our senior economist, about this idea of the economy just snapping back when restrictions ease. G'day, Matt. G'day, Ebony. So, Matt, what is this concept of the economy snapping back for a start? Well, this is the idea that um, we're about to have a very deep recession or a very big downturn in the economy. Um, And the idea is, is the economy will snap back to where it was relatively quickly. That is, uh, we'll shut the, we've shut the economy down. That's caused the slowdown in economic growth, the negative economic growth, the, uh, the decrease in GDP. Um, and that, but that will quickly return back to normal um, and it will snap back basically to normal. And how realistic is this concept? Is that what's actually happening or likely to happen? No, it's not likely to happen at all. Um, and the reason is, is that once the economy slows down, it takes, it's a lot harder to speed it back up again. Once unemployment starts to rise, once people lose their jobs, unemployment traditionally goes down very, very slowly during a recovery. Uh, you know, basically the economy is made up of consumer spending plus investment spending plus government spending plus exports minus imports. That's how, as economists, we sort of break the economy down. And consumption is not going to snap back. Investment is not going to snap back. Um, net exports are not going to snap back. And uh, if the government gets rid of its job keeper and job seeker funding after six months, then government spending is not going to snap us back. So basically, the economy is not likely to immediately snap back. But at the moment, we have people like Treasury and just more recently, the Reserve Bank come out and they are predicting that the uh, economy will actually snap back. 
So let's talk about the Reserve Bank and its predictions in its monetary policy statement. What did they have to say? Well, its monetary policy statement, which just came out, it's predicting that the economy will fall by 10% in the first six months of this year. Um, And so most of that will happen in April, May, um, June, after the lockdown sort of started. But then in the next, the second six months of 2020, um, it will, uh, the the economy will have fallen um, for the whole year by um, 6%, which means in the last six months of the year, it's expecting the economy will grow by 4%. Now, growth of 4% in six months means an annualised growth rate of 8%, which is massive growth. And some of that might be justified because there are large parts of the economy um, that have been deliberately shut down and therefore are not producing or or, um, contributing to GDP in any way. So when, when the lockdowns ease in those areas, then they'll suddenly come back to life. Uh, maybe not at the same level as before the shutdown, but they'll certainly start contributing to GDP. But then the RBA is predicting that the economy will then continue to grow um, at about 6% um, for the next couple of years. And a growth of 6% is quite large. It's quite fast. Um, And the reason they're predicting that in a lot of ways, is to do with with the kind of economic models they have. That is, their model is basically telling them that for some reason the economy will grow quite quickly. Long-term listeners of Follow the Money will know that we've had quite a bit to say on economic models over the years and that if you put in, you know, rubbish assumptions, then you get rubbish outcomes at the other end. So what are some of the assumptions in the RBA that the RBA is using that would lead to you know, these enormous growth rates that seem quite unrealistic? Well, these models have this funny assumption. Or, or let me break them down a little bit. Basically, there are two models buried in these, um, these, this model. Uh, one that predicts the long-run growth rate of the Australian economy and one that predicts the short term growth rate. And the long-term growth rate is actually pretty simple. Um, There are only three things that the RBA and Treasury think will affect the long-run growth of the economy. And that is the size of the population, how how much of the population is actually um, in work or looking for work, and we call that participation. So population and the participation of that population in the workforce. And productivity, which is the amount of stuff each worker um, produces. So the long-run economy is basically based on the three Ps, population, um, participation and productivity. And what the model does is it works out where the economy will be based on these three Ps. Now, the economy is not um, at its long-run growth rate usually, um, and this is where the short-run part of the model comes in. The short-run part of the model basically takes where we are right now, it looks at what's happening, but then it ultimately predicts that we will go back to the long-run point. So why is this important? Well, if we have a massive shock and and a 10% drop in six months is, let's face it, a massive shock to the economy, then what we're basically getting a long way from is the long-run growth rate. And so what the model does is it says, well, over uh, a period of time, we need to get back to that. So it basically assumes that we're going to therefore grow faster because we're further away from the long-run growth rate point. So effectively, this model has built in it the idea that the further you get from the long-run growth rate, the faster you'll get back. Or to put another way, the bigger the recession is, the faster the recovery will be. I mean, is there anything in history that would lead those assumptions to be close to the mark? No, there isn't. And that's the problem. Um, The size of the recession doesn't usually have anything to do with the size of the recovery. Um, That is, um, the time it takes to get back to where we would have been um, isn't based on the size of the downturn. And when you think about it, if the economy takes a big shock, why would that induce firms to invest more, induce consumers to spend more, induce the rest of the world to want to buy our stuff more? Um, These are the things that are going to create um, employment growth and economic growth within the economy. And the size of the recession isn't going to mean that that people want to spend more, invest more, um, and, and people overseas buy our stuff more. In fact, the opposite it might well be true for some of those. That is, is a large recession is going to cause more concern within the economy, is going to make businesses think twice about investing, it's going to make consumers think twice 
about spending. Um, and if the rest of the world is involved in this recession, as, as is the case with COVID, then the rest of the world is not going to be rushing out to buy our stuff. Either. Is it the experience from past recessions, how we know that it's likely to be a very slow recovery? Yeah, that's right. Um, we've had uh, six recessions since the, uh, the ABS, the Australian Bureau of Statistics, started producing quarterly GDP growth numbers. And we should probably say that a recession is technically defined as two negative quarters of economic growth in a row. And I say technically because there isn't really a, a, um, a completely agreed on definition of a recession. But most people, when you're talking about a recession, they're talking about two negative quarters in a row. And we've had six of those. And if we go back and we look at those, um, we see that, that it's really varied how um, what happens after the recession. Um, some of them grew back reasonably quickly. The uh, one that grew back the fastest was in 1961, the first one we had since uh, they started doing data in, in the, the late 1950s. But most recently, the 1991 recession, the last recession we had in Australia, um, it took 12 months, basically, for GDP to get back to the level it was before the recession started. So uh, it, it, snapbacks don't necessarily happen, um, and um, you know they, they can take quite some time for, for growth to get going again. Mm, okay. So it's a little bit like the reverse of losing weight. It takes a long time to lose weight and just a few weeks to put it back on, in my experience. Yes, yes, <laughs> definitely. Um, and this is really important, actually, um, because there's a real difference between um, levels and rates. So there's the level of GDP, and it's the level of GDP that determines how much employment there'll be, how much tax will get collected. Um, it's the level of GDP that creates jobs. And there's the rate of GDP growth. So if we have a massive fall in GDP, a big drop, then you might have a quarter of fast economic growth, but that doesn't mean that you've gone back to where you were. So it's the level that's most important and the rate of growth that's secondary. So Matt, when it comes to GDP growth, you've talked about the rate and the level. Why is it important to know the difference between the two? Well, it's important um, for a number of reasons. The first is, um, would you prefer to earn $100,000 a year that increases at 1% a year or $1,000 a year that increases at 10% a year? Well, most people would take the $100,000 that has a slower growth rate because it's far larger than the $1,000. In fact, everybody should choose that if you want to earn more money. But most of the time, it doesn't really matter because the economy kind of bumbles along at between, you know, uh, 2 and 4% a year. And so what's important is the growth rate. But when you have a massive drop in GDP, the one that we're, we're looking to um, face, like a 10% drop that the RBA is predicting the level becomes important suddenly. It's important where the level is. And why is the level important? Well, the level is the thing that determines how much employment there's going to be in the economy. So it's the size of the economy, the total amount that's being produced in the economy that determines how many people we need to produce it. So the level is really important at this point. If we have a large increase in the rate of economic growth after a huge drop in the level, that might not take us back to where we were. It might sound impressive, it might be a large increase, but it's the level of um, GDP that will determine employment. And so therefore a big drop with, with then a, a, an increase in GDP growth afterwards might see us with less employment and a, a smaller economy. Yeah, well, it does make me think about kind of the, the first couple of weeks. And, you know, it struck me that the population at large, the general public, was taking on board more of that, you know, social distancing and staying at home message quite in advance of what the government um, had prescribed. And so you were already seeing people not going to the shops as often and things like that before we even got to the, you know, the heavier restrictions. Yeah. And look, even if it was a more traditional recession and not one caused by a health crisis, um, when unemployment goes up, well, the unemployed have less money than they used to have when they were employed to spend. So they spend less. But it's not just the unemployed people who will be spending less. If people are worried about losing their job, if they look out and they see on the news every night and on the radio and in the newspapers, the fact that there are lots of people out there looking for work and they think, well, look, if I lose my job, what are the chances of me getting another job? Well, they're great 
greatly reduced, so I'm worried. And they're also worried that because the recession's on, you know, their boss might walk in and say, well, look, we're going to have to sack some of you. Um, when people are worried, they don't rush out and buy new cars. When they're worried, they don't rush out and buy new white goods. When they're worried, they don't rush out and um, take long holidays or expensive holidays. What they do instead is they try and build a, a reserve. They try and build up their savings. So they're effectively going to spend less than they would normally spend. Um, and this contraction in spending means that... Um, Firms, businesses are going to sell less stuff. And if they sell less stuff, they're going to need less people to make that stuff. Um, and so worried consumers spending less will make the recession worse, not better. So then looking also, I guess, back in history and other times when we've had recessions, obviously the Great Depression is kind of the most famous one and our 90s recession is the most recent one in Australia. But you know, I get the sense from a lot of commentators and even some policymakers of this idea that um, once we lift the restrictions, everything will go back to normal and business, you know, if we just uh, give them enough incentives to invest, then, you know, everything will, will be, you know, happy as Larry pretty quick. But what you're talking about is this idea of more about consumer confidence and demand and, and what governs how much people are willing to spend and how much they're comfortable spending. So what's the role of government, I guess? Well, that's exactly right. So when, when consumers don't want to spend, businesses don't want to invest, and the rest of the world is also in recession, so they're not buying our stuff, this is the time for government to step up and um, to fill that hole. Remember, uh, we think of GDP as consumption plus investment plus government spending plus exports minus imports. So when the, the consumers aren't spending, businesses aren't investing and um, overseas aren't buying our exports, then, gee, government spending is, is, is the thing that's left. Um, and that's why we need sort of this traditional stimulus when the economy opens up to try and kickstart um, employment, to kickstart demand within the economy and get things moving. And my fear is, is that the government are constantly talking about what they call is a, a business-centred recovery. Now, um, if businesses are feeling really wealthy because, say, house in good times, house prices are going up, you can often have a consumer-led recovery. That is, consumers go out and spend more. If uh, countries overseas um, want to buy our stuff quite a bit. China, for example, in the mid um, noughties, um, there was a mining boom. They wanted to buy our stuff. You could have an export-led recovery. But I've never heard of a, a, an investment-led recovery. They don't happen that way. So the only time I could think that this might actually possibly happen is if a new technology came along and a heap of businesses wanted to change their plants and equipment to upgrade it. But usually business reacts to consumer spending and uh, spending from overseas and government spending. That is, is if these other parts of the economy are buying their stuff, then they get involved, then they start investing and expanding and making more stuff. But businesses don't usually lead recoveries. This means that if you shovel a heap of stimulus money into businesses, you're not going to get much of a reaction. But if you put a whole load of money in, say, consumers' pockets, then consumers are going to go out and buy stuff from business and business are going to invest and employ more. So, I mean, the best thing you can do for business during a recession is put money in the pockets of their customers. Uh, just giving businesses money isn't going to lead us to a recovery. Well, we might wrap it up there. Thank you very much, Matt. Thanks for having me. This has been a special episode of Follow the Money, and we're aiming to bring you shorter but more frequent episodes during the pandemic. So make sure that you're subscribed. You can check out the Australia Institute's Economics of a Pandemic webinar series at our website, tai.org.au forward slash webinars. The next event is on Wednesday the 13th of May at noon Australian Eastern Standard Time with former New Zealand Prime Minister Helen Clark and Alan Beam, the head of the Australia Institute's International and Security Affairs Program, and they'll be talking about the international responses to the pandemic. It's free, but registration is essential, so go to our website to register. For the latest health information, please check health.gov.au or listen to the ABC's excellent CoronaCast podcast, which comes out daily. You can visit tai.org.au for all our latest research and content. And we're on Twitter at the Oz Institute with an AUS. My Twitter handle is ebony underscore Bennett with a double N double T and Matt is at Matt Grudnoff. That's G-R-U-D-N-O-F-F. -F. 
This episode was produced by Jennifer Macy with help from Mia Hull, Grace Crivellero and Brandon Ryman. Our theme music is by Jonathan McFeet from Pulse and Thrum. And please stay home if you can, keep washing those hands and thanks for listening. Thank you.